All right, so I kind of give I kind of given everyone kind of like an overview of the current state, kind of like um kind of like market analysis. You can kind of talk talk about that. So now the next thing is really getting to the really nitty gritty details of that. Is um of course unfortunately with the uh, time and the size, it's really hard to give everyone that hands on on building a library, loading a sequencer. So what I would try to do is do my best to kind of describe you. Some of the process, actually, what we do at the bench level, um, give you an idea how a workflow looks like, and also actually kind of help to link it to you because a, a lot of the thing is that we are all kind of tied together in that big workflow. You know, the patient samples from a next gen sequencing comes from literally every one of you here, and how we can actually link that together so that we actually do our best to help our patient. I think that's the, the major take home message that I will actually get through actually for this talk. All right. So in this section, what I'm going to talk about is we'll go through a bit of things that you 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 may be very familiar with, which is bio, biological specimen, but really in the context of next gen sequencing. And then I will give you some um, kind of a glimpse into the step by step uh, library prep protocol, especially in the um, given the time, like for the Illumina short read uh, sequencing. And then also give you a kind of idea, like say after you get the library, what you're going to do, how you're going to load it onto the sequencer. We'll see those. Kind of instrument in person later on in a lab too. But I'll kind of give you an idea, like kind of like what our daily workflow actually looks like. And then lastly, kind of touch, spend a few slides on lab qualification and accreditation, especially you know we're really talking about clinical tests here. So I kind of give a context actually what how we see in terms of actually now moving actually even next gen sequencing as a clinical actual application. All right, so. For next gen sequencing, actually, the the challenge of samples is actually quite big there. So, if you think about that, the sample quality and quantity could, and I think this was already kind of like kids already kind of uh, talk a little bit about that, uh, ask a little bit about that. It does actually impact um, clinical sequencing, and unfortunately, a lot of the uh, our, our current pathology standard procedures may not. Uh, uh, take NGS requirement into consideration. And today, actually, this is actually what I want to kind of give you kind of like some idea, especially you going become one of those pathologists, maybe handling samples, how you want to tie what you're doing to the potential next step. So the thing about that is that like, you know, we have a big diversity of input to a next gen sequence. It could be uh, different tissue uh, origin, the age of your tissue, especially for those uh, preserved samples, the method of your pres uh, preservation, and nowadays a lot of liquid biopsy that's being thrown around as a term of uh, our studies, um, the amount of tissue available, also actually contamination, uh, you know, contamination either from you know a procedure or contamination from just neighboring, like if, if you're studying oncology, like you know your neighboring normal cells to your tumor cells, you know how does that affect? Um, you know, next-gen sequencing outcome. So really important is that, is that I cannot help to rescue a samples that come in as a poor quality. Really, it really starts from the very, very like, front end, actually. So, so really, I think that a lot of the time when we work with collaborators, it's really that we try to kind of think through it as early as possible in, in, in the planning stage. Because if you think about it, it is actually, I hate to say that, it is really garbage in and garbage out. So um, so I know that this term, sometimes we joke about it, but but for us, actually, really, we see it actually like on a daily basis, actually, this is actually the real case here. So I think this is one of the actually, like, say, I would say that if I said something wrong, please correct me. I'm not, a, I'm really not into like the pathologist's end of the story. So I'm trying to get like, the best picture available, but... Um, but just kind of thinking about, you know, as a cancer patient, um, uh, solid tumor, um, what you kind of want to think about. So number one is your study. If you're doing a clinical trial, is your study a prospective or retrospective assay. So in more and more specifically, do you actually have control of how you collect the samples? You know, they would be great, actually, if you do, actually, because you really now can fit everything into the, uh, the, the workflow. Um, the method and quantity of the tissue to be collected. Is it a surgical biopsy? Is it a core? Is it a fine needle? Or is it even a skin biopsy? So those are needed to be taken into consideration. The storage of the tissue. Are those fresh frozen or there's formalin fixed? Is it a block versus a slide? 
Then finally, would you be able to assess additional tissue processing like LCM or macro dissection and things like that? So again, if you look at the the one on the right hand side here, like as a slide, and I, I'm pretty sure you know if they if the offer labels like this is actually like collected from from an online example. If the offer actually kind of labeled the, the the picture wrongly, just let me know. But you can see actually like say there are different region of your slide that has a higher tumor content, tumor cells content versus actually very low. What you really want to do is if you want to really study the biology of um, the tumor, you really want to go with the region actually that is high. But even in our heads, what we notice is actually is that even if you have a high tumor contents on the slide, it may not convert to high tumor content in the informatics way on the sequencing because your cells may be dead or you may actually have so smaller cells, normal cells that, that may be contaminating around that you may not know. So, so a lot of these actually need to be taken into consideration. But really important thing, I think that what we kind of think of our mindset is that are you giving your samples the best chance to succeed in the NGN assay? In fact, is are you giving your patient with samples on your hand the best chance to succeed in the NGS um, assay? So what you want to do is actually is really to do the best possible preservation of the DNA or RNA in the cell or tissue with the highest possible cellularity. That's kind of like you want to really break it down. This is really what we want to do from a sample's point of view. So something to think about, I'm pretty sure this you may know, and I'm just not going to go into detail of that. We can again discuss it actually offline. Um, fresh tissues, um, snap free is always best um, uh, for, for, for sequencing, for DNA and RNA quality. Um, it does prevent actual RNA degradation and avoid crystal formation. If you do need to do sectioning using OCT, um, uh, um, uh, embedding, embedding will also be very helpful. Uh, for FFP, which is the most common way of preserving, um, preserving actually um, um, your tissue, um, just to think about is that they are the major factors that's impacting DNA RNA quality is the age of your samples, but also oxidation. So, so what we normally suggest is that try to keep your tissue in a block instead of uh, uh, sectioning it. Um, and avoid and, and really avoid storing a slide. And, and if you really, really need to do that for, for your logistic reason, what you can consider, um, what we have tried is that you can uh, section it and then follow by a paraffin dip so that at least you can protect your slide so that there's actually minimal uh, oxidation that, that can be presented to your tissue samples. Of course, more, more and more common liquid biopsy is uh, a really kind of front and center for a lot of uh, um, um, kind of a diagnosis and also next-gen sequencing as your samples type. Um, yep. It does um, impact usually the quality of your DNA, they are seems to be more susceptible to um, to uh, degradation and, and whatnot. And so it really kind of like, you know, we've seen that a lot of time um, it, it does really kind of um, make your DNA or RNA quality extracted from the old, like a, a slide, um, especially being stored like a long time. Uh, very, very poor. And, and, and also the color, your, your DNA quality itself now becomes actually very like, you know, you, they may be damaged to your, your nucleotide and really actually hard for it to, um, to get actually, let's say, sequenced properly. Mm -hmm. It does actually, I think that it, it kind of like is a hand in hand thing too, because actually your, your DNA, like yeah, especially in your FFPE uh, samples, your DNA and RNA, so like your, your DNA proteins are also cross-linked. So kind of like your, your kind of whole stabilization may also get affected also with that. It does actually, usually actually lead to more degradation. Like, you know, it's not like oxidation is cutting it in, it's actually the overall Couple, like you know, your DNA become DNA and they become more susceptible to degradation, degradation over time. That's actually what happens. All right, coming back to liquid biopsies. Traditionally, we think liquid biopsy is like whole blood, plasma, and serum. But just kind of think about there is beyond 
lot um, uh, at this point. A lot of people are looking into, like, you know, you can detect uh, a lot of uh, cancer marker in things like urine, CSF, saliva, seminal fluid, and all the other stuff. Like, I have a picture here if you want to kind of uh, look in the more details of some of the uh, things that people have seen. Now, in terms of liquid biopsy, something you want to consider is that for liquid biopsy, other than actually whole blood or buffy coat, the general DNA and RNA quantity could be very, very low. Like in general, you're looking at actually one to 100 nanogram per milliliter. And, um, and also the other thing that you want to consider, and, and, and this is actually where like in the next I'll talk a little bit about uh, preservation, is that you know the, the, these DNA are basically kind of uh, 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 um, cell-free. They are cell-free DNA. So they are basically floating in the blood unprotected. So if you if you kind of don't do a good job of preservation, then they will get further degraded. And so even if you may have a signal of your biomarker or biomarker gene, um, they may not there actually if you don't kind of take good care of that. And the other thing is actually is that you don't want to have contamination from something else. For example, like if you have a whole blood drawn and you don't kind of um, quickly uh, uh, isolate the plasma sample from it, for example. You know, hemolysis can happen, right? And another cell degradation. And now you are releasing a lot of cellular DNA that might interfere things that you kind of want to see in there. I think actually the uh, the, the conversion of the slide also kind of blocked that last statement here. Uh, the other thing that um, us as a molecular always care about is uh, samples that is uh, collected in heparin. Heparin is definitely a, a major inhibitor for a lot of enzymes, um, especially a lot of the ligation enzyme transcriptase really Kind of get inhibited. So um, any any samples that get co collected in heparin usually we avoid working on that. So think about preservation. Um, the the normal things that we know uh, I recommend people for plasma is that you know I think a lot of a lot of labs still collect uh, plasma DNA in EDTA. Um, of course, again, no no heparin, please. Um, um, what you want to do for EDTA is really separate these um, as soon as possible because um, um, they, you definitely will start um, seeing hemolysis actually very quickly with that. The other way I think more commonly now, nowadays, and a lot of actually um, uh, uh, um, biobank would know that, is really collect um, the, uh, uh, um, any study for, for plasma on a Strack gene. Uh, Strack is the company that sells a lot of the preservation product. Similar to the RNA, same thing, EDTA chip or STRAC um, nucleic acid uh, BCT chip is a good um, uh, way to collect them. If in a special study you want to actually study the whole blood, you, there is other products uh, like BD Kaiju, you also have a, a PAX gene chip that you know, I think you may have heard about. Another actually um, a product that you can, um, you can collect them. Most of these blood chips you can see in the market is that unlike the normal, let's like, say, EDTA chip, that your EDTA is lyophilized at the bottom, of the um, the blood tube, these actually have a liquid uh, pre uh, um, uh, preservation lead in there. So you draw directly into that preservation lead and then you mix them up. All right, um, so that's kind of like the collection part, really kind of uh, to think through it. Um, now I want to move into, no, so now you have the samples. Now you want to actually get the RNA and DNA into, um, you, you got, you're gonna extract the RNA and DNA from from these samples. And in order to have a successful library prep, some of the general guideline for consideration is as follow. Um, so, so again, just think about, I think, especially for DNA, what you want to think about is actually, that I, as we mentioned earlier, one genome is around six picogram of DNA. So of course, actually, if you want to study whole genome, you know, six picogram DNA is literally actually, like say more or less not sufficient, um, especially given that there might be efficiency actually also in your library prep. So normally what we want people to kind of submit is around say for fresh frozen tissue or puppy coat, which is good quality DNA around 25 nanogram, FFPE around 50 nanogram, and then for plasma DNA especially, they are very, very low quantity. 10, 10 nanogram is usually sufficient. But if you're looking at actually high, um, uh, like your high, like your um, PCR free um, prep or long read, you probably need way much more in the range of actually 100 to 100, um, 1,000 nanogram. For RNA, um, 50 nanogram of fresh frozen is good, 200 nanogram for FFP RNA is good. So what does that mean? What does this translate to kind of like a, kind of like from a sample collection uh, language? So you're looking at like roughly, let's say for blood and buffy coat, you probably need like around like you know, 250 microliter. And then for FFPE, um, 10 micron slides will be good. We noticed that 
kind of thinness lies may not be as well. A lot of the time, thinness lie may actually cause a bit more of degradation for some unknown reason. Actually, I, as a, this is just more observation. I really don't have a uh, way to kind of explain that. Um, the other thing really you want, like you know, if possible, again, you know, keep it at the shoot block and then kind of sessionate into um, um, micron slides, uh, 10 micron slides. But also make sure pathology review, um, make sure the tumor content is uh, at the minimum, actually 30%. Um, that's really, really important. Same for frozen tissues. Um, uh, you want around five millicube, uh, millimeter cube, um, and then high tumor content. Now, of course, you can also try to do LCM, but it really depends on how efficient your collection of the uh, uh, cells number in. And you can kind of think about using actually the six picogram of DNA and think about like the amount of cells you really want. Like usually you're talking about in the range of 10 to 100,000 cells, which would probably give you a very, very good amount of DNA to work with. And then lastly, plasma um, recommendation is around one tube of strack. Usually that's like, that means like about from a one single strack tube, um, double spin and, uh, and the plasma they get out. We have worked with a lower amount, but you know, in general, what you want to do is just kind of have as much as possible to start with. All right, any questions? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Yes, you could um, sequence a little bit deeper to that. We we also actually do, actually, you can also do like a shallow sequence to kind of screen off if the sample, let's say for example, you you get a very low amount, like 10% right, on, 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 on the slide, but it might turn out to be 0%. It may be all actually like normal tissue. So instead of going forward with the full, full genome, you may actually elect to share, like, you know, you can actually sequence, because what you can do is that a lot of the tumor samples um, have quite significant copy number changes. So those doesn't need actually like, you know, at the base pair level kind of a resolution. You can actually sequence your, your whole genome library at like say, you know, um, 0.1x of your genome, which could be run on the MySeq or NICSeq at a very low cost. And then think about actually whether like, you know, whether you get sufficient tumor content to move forward. So, so that's one way, but definitely let's say, I think I'll leave like kind of uh, maybe Larry and Ian maybe discuss a little bit more further now in the talk that that definitely, you know, you may kind of like the, the, the callability of your samples and your tumor content, they go hand in hand. It does actually can affect, can be affected by uh, genome death. Um, but again, you know, it, it will be also a dollar sign that, uh, 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 question that you have to ask. Yeah, I, I can just add to that briefly. So you can pile on more depth. But the difficulty is, in addition to sequencing more tumor, you're sequencing more non-tumor, right? So this, uh, what you're trying to do is detect if the tumor mutation can express the kind of protective signals and much like the kind of noise, which is uh, the normal genome. So again, there's limited, mm -hmm. there's a limited protection for this assay, which I'll talk about quite a bit in my session. Um, so that is a challenge with uh, the clinical sample delivery. Yeah, and then also actually you think about is how's prevalent your uh, like if you look at somatic variants, for example, how 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 prevalent is it is actually at a one percent level, ten percent level, or let's say if it's actually point five point zero five level, and and that actually is a totally kind of different magnitude of differences of the amount of sequence that you quite top it up to that too. So, all right, I'll um, go through a few procedure of um, kind of how you extract DNA and RNA. So normally, just to kind of let you imagine actually how these work is that it usually work on a standard lab bench. Usually it's done manually, although I, I'll, I'll talk about other alternative methods. But usually it's a single bench. Uh, all you need is kind of a standard pipettes. Um, if you walk, want to work for a few more samples, probably take a like multi-channel pipette. That also can be done. Uh, most of the time you need you know, a, a kind of a commercial kit for extraction, which provide all the reagents and the consumables that you need. Um, and then usually a heat block and micro centrifuge. That's kind of more or less what you need to kind of use for your um, extraction. Nothing too fancy at, at all with that. So let's start with the simplest one, the buffy coat and the tissue DNA. This is actually the way that we do here at OICR. 
It's even quite simple. If you look at actually the uh, workflow on the right-hand side, this is actually with a gene, uh, uh, with a kid called Pure Gene from the, uh, uh, Kaigen. What you do is you have your samples, you mesh up, you lyse it, you do a protein precipitation, and then from that, you collect a supernatant that doesn't have actually protein. Um, and then you precipitate out the DNA. Right? That's like standard precipitation that, that we all learn from a molecular biology course with a high salt and ethanol. And then after that, you wash the palate and then you kind of rehydrate your DNA. So it's really kind of standard car protocol. Again, do it in a microfiche through a centrifuge. The couple of things you want to think about to kind of give your best chance for your DNA um, uh, um, preservation is, number one is you probably want to add the lysis um, directly to the curls. Um, and then if you're capturing those cells actually on the LCM, kind of uh, instead of just keep the, uh, the, the cap, kind of add, add the cap directly to a lysis mix and then, and then kind of you use that to transfer. And then for buffy coat, um, it depends on how your buffy coat comes in. Is it already separated or is it actually coming as a whole blood? So if you do have a whole blood, again, kind of process them as quickly as possible. Um, lyse the red blood cells. A lot of the kids actually will come with what we call the red blood cells lysis solution, which is basically a very low source solution to kind of use osmosis to pop up actually the RBC cells. Um, and, then, and then now you're left with actually all your buffy coat or leukocytes. So make sure actually you clean up that also pretty well um, uh, through centrifugation, okay? And then, and then as you can see, this protocol is by precipitation. So in general, you get your intact DNA. What I mean intact DNA is actually, it's not shear, it's not fragmented. So however, like you know, for short read, it really not, is not the biggest problem. But if you do are thinking about using this DNA for your long read, one of the things actually what we normally do and a lot see a lot of people do is that you know you have your pipette tip, for example, maybe a P200 or P1000 pipette tip, kind of cut out the end of it, the pointed end of it, and make it a little bit wider opening. In, in general, it will help a little bit because what you want to do is when you pipette up and down your DNA, you actually are doing a shearing motion. So what you want to do is actually you have a bigger opening so that avoid uh, the shearing of the DNA. So that's the other thing that, that may be good, especially if you're looking at like, you know, running a um, nanopore or pack bio ex experiment. Now for FFP and RNA, DNA and RNA, you can do the DNA or RNA separately, but here actually we use, and I want to introduce you to kind of like the process we do here is that we use a kit called the Kaijin All Prep DNA RNA FFP. So this here is kind of maybe more efficient in a way that you can kind of make sure that you get, especially if you don't have a lot of samples, you could kind of be efficient and isolate both RNA and DNA together from the same sample. So the way that you do it is, you know, if you have a slide, you kind of scrape off the area that you want to uh, uh, work on. And then first of all, you want to get rid of the um, paraffin. You usually use solvent, uh, like, like the old days, they're really saline. It's actually the one to dissolve the, um, the FFPE, uh, the paraffin. Uh, there is actually a more kind of a friendly, sample friendly um, product out there. So you can kind of look up the market actually for that. Once you get rid of the paraffin, you're left with the tissue. And now what you do is, uh, as you see in the flow chart, then now you first do your first um, lysis with a proteinase K digestion, just to kind of get rid of all the cross link of the proteins. And then after that, you kind of separate the DNA and the RNA. Um, the way they do is actually by centrifugation. And then after that, once you split it out, and I'll, I'll go through one at a time, but both actually, both uh, DNA and RNA start, start off with a um, heat incubation. So for the DNA, it, for the RNA, it's a short 80 degrees um, and like usually about 10, 15 minutes uh, uh, incubation. For, R, uh, for DNA, it takes a, like a 90, higher degree, higher uh, amount of time, uh, 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 temperature and also slightly higher time. The reason why you do that is that the high temperature of the incubation is actually helping to reverse the formalin crosslink. So that's actually one of the way to get rid of the formalin crosslink. So you actually do two, two things here to kind of help to release the pure DNA RNA into the, the system. One is actually doing a uh, proteinase K digestion to digest any protein that's attached to your protein, but also you're actually doing a heat treatment to kind of get rid of the formula crosslink. Now, once you get to that point, now you can actually use what we call a, a spin column uh, 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 to, to help purify the RNA and DNA. The way that it works, and I, I kind of show it in here, is actually is that these kind of columns, it's, it's actually can fit into a microfuge. It has a filter on top of that. That filter usually is a silica-based resin. 
And they usually are modified in a way that like, you know, you add um, kind of like a uh, um, 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 chemical called DAE to kind of um, make it a, a positive charge on the surface. What it does then is like that the, the positive charge on your resin now will bind to your, the backbone of your DNA RNA, which has the phosphate group, which is a negative charge, right? Your overall surface charge, your RNA and DNA are negative. So, so this anion exchange column um, will basically use charge and you can enhance it by adding salt and lowering the pH. It will actually help bind those RNA and DNA to the column. All the crap, like you call it, will go through the column. You won't, you won't bind to the column. And now you can actually, you know, and again, these are done by centrifugation for binding. And after that, you can eat, like for the RNA, you can treat it with DNAs to get rid of any uh, DNA and then wash them and then elute the, um, the pure DNA or RNA from the column. With it. And usually you, you elute it in a low TE or water, okay? So that's kind of like the normal way. And, and because centrifuge is actually very, very quick, you can spin it for like a few seconds and then the, the liquid will pass through. Alternatively, you can also do magnetic. These, these um, chemistry can also be done actually on a uh, magnetic beat. So that usually, if, especially if you have a much higher number of samples, you want to do like an automation. That's an approach that you can also do. All right, coming back to uh, fresh frozen RNA, um, what you want to do is very similar. Again, use uh, use uh, uh, um, kind of like a spin column um, uh, um, chemistry for that. But for RNA, because RNA is very, very labor, and you want to actually get the highest quality possible, which I would mention a little bit later on, what you want to do is you want to uh, lyse your um, tissue samples or cell samples in something that immediately inhibits the RNAs, uh, especially when you burst out a cells. The, the, nucleus, the nucleus will get released and go start attacking your DNA and RNA, especially RNA will be much labor. So what you do is a lot of the, these um, reagents, the lysis contain a um, kaotrop, um, usually it's granidium uh, isothiocyanate, and they actually will add an immediate protector. So then actually, let's say you can work through the process quickly without having your RNA actually um, degraded in the middle of that. So again, same thing, it is actually lysis and then bind it to a um, uh, NI exchange column using a, a, a microfuge, and then wash, and then you do the RNA, pure RNA. Right, lastly is uh, plasma DNA, cell-free DNA. So remember, actually, I said that you probably need like around 6 ml of, um, of uh, uh, starting material for plasma. So if you think about microfuge, microfuge normally holds about 1 to 2 milliliter of liquid. So 6 ml is definitely quite a bit. So the way that um, some of the products out there, this is actually another Kaiser product that does this, is that you can lyse your plasma samples, and then they actually have a device where there's a long tube attached to a spin column, and now you can actually um, lyse them, lyse the um, plasma samples, including actually proteinase K digestion, but actually in a much big volume, like say in the 10, 20 ml. Now you can actually pass them through this uh, NIN exchange column through vacuum. So you kind of actually really use vacuum to kind of suck the um, lysate through the um, through the uh, NI exchange uh, resin membrane, and then after that you can actually detach the uh, spin column away from that big tube at the top, and now you continue the standard um, uh, uh, um, purification through spin spin column uh, um, chromatography. Okay, any questions in terms of extraction? Again, I try to. Uh, I, I, I did not try to download a video on that, but I tried to kind of explain to you actually from a good schematic. All right, now you got DNA and RNA. Now what are you gonna do? You're gonna, not really make sure it's good looking before you move forward with that. So I'm gonna spend a couple of slides talking about um, the uh, quality and quantity um, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, DNA and RNA extract. So, so for quantification, so the amount is pretty simple. Um, there's multiple methods. You can do special photometer like a nano drop or, or, or uh, um, spec, but usually it's not the preferred way because um, it may, especially you know, if you think about the 260 to 80 ratio, you may sometimes get like additional protein or other molecules in there. You can, really cannot distinguish whether it's a pure RNA or DNA or not. So what we usually recommend um, um, uh, for quantification is using a uh, for, like a DNA or RNA specific uh, fluorescent dye. So Normally we use a this handheld um, uh, instrument called Qubit, and you kind of um, you add the actual fluorescent dye to to a small aliquot of your DNA, and then you measure the actual quantity, and you use the kind of like standard curve 
to kind of uh, de uh, decide actually, uh, determine actually the, the quantity. And then in terms of uh, DNA quality, so so again, you if you especially if you're doing things like uh, a long list, you definitely want to make sure that your DNA are in, in uh, intact. There's a, there's a few ways to you can do that. Um, I'm going to introduce you to some instrument. Um, of course, um, a lot of people even still are using a gel electrophoresis um, to kind of uh, resolve our DNA fragments. But there is definitely an instrument, and you will see almost all of them uh, in in the lab tour um, that that really do the job. But more importantly, create a, a digitalized image that you can literally quantify also, or actually let's say at least do some quantification on that. So. Kind of like sure from um, from kind of like throughput from from top to bottom is like increased throughput. Um, you have the traditional what we call bioanalyzer, and then at the tape station, and then um, fragment analyzer where like you know so tape station fragment analyzer you can actually analyze DNA samples or RNA samples in plates. Um, and these actually are all owned by the same company called Agilent. So um, um, if you want to look up um, all those information. Um, the way that they're doing it is um, there's two ways of doing the so-called um, the digitalized uh, electrophoresis. Uh, one is actually with either a capillary. The capillary can be either on a chip or actually on the actual um, capillary array, like kind of like a strength of a long capillary. Um, versus actually also there's a uh, kind of like a miniaturized gel system called a tape station. Same thing, you can actually run 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 your sample on these like tiny little gel lanes and then what you ended up getting is on the right-hand side, on the top, um, like a digitalized uh, uh, DNA gel pictures. And, um, and what you can see here is, as an example, is on the right-hand side is the kind of DNA with the highest kind of integrity, with the highest molecular weight, versus basically towards the left-hand side, where mo most of the time you might be seeing actually in FFP sample, like degraded DNA. So one of the things that people can use is using the DNA integrity number. Um, to kind of um, study them. But if you think about for um, short reads, at the end of the day, we still are fragmenting the DNA down to a smaller size. So in the short read world, the DIN is not as critical as for the RIN for RNA integrity number, which I'm going to go through next section. So, but then for something like a long read, you might actually have to consider kind of looking into these numbers. All right, for RNA, same thing, you can quantify by fluorescent method and then use the same instrument that I just introduced to you um, to, to kind of look at their quality. And this is actually really now the very important part for using these kind of gel electrophoresis. So here's the picture where I can give you a range of the DNA and RNA there. So if you look at the, the, the one RNA link on the left-hand side, that's kind of what you consider the, the highest quality RNA. What you have is actually, number one, there is actually minimal um, genomic DNA contamination. It's like, you know, just pure RNA. Number two is actually is that the major structure of the RNA transcript uh, pool is there. So the, the easiest um, recognized la landmark is your the presence of your two large ribosome RNA, the 28S and the, uh, sorry, actually I have a typo there, it's 18S, 16S actually for bacteria actually. So I was probably actually thinking about something else when I was writing that. And then uh, at the at the bottom, you can see those letter is actually the messenger RNA, the made the kind of like the made like major abundance actually messenger RNA. So that's actually what you call a good RNA samples. Um, just a quick question, just kind of like in the middle of it to make sure we are following. Anyone can remember what's the S behind the twenty eight S and eighteen S? Yes, and what is it? kind of, um, what's this unit about? Sorry? Yes. Yeah. But uh, the S is a unit, is a quantity unit. What is it? Yes. Yeah. Has anyone actually used a, uh, what we call a uh, density or sucrose gradient? You. <laughs> I want I want to just say that if you do actually, you probably as well as me. Um, yeah, so so it it is actually um this is actually like a um a value you can look at the density, uh, especially actually on like a like a density gradient. So what you do is that the way that they did actually, I 
really actually, I, I'm not 60. I'm, I'm, by, I'm, I'm not that far away from 60, I guess. Is they really those old days actually in the in the in the early days of uh, biochemistry actually people how they um, isolate the um, ribosomal um, complex is basically spinning the cell extract through what we call a a tube of uh, sucrose gradient. So you load them on top of actually a a tube with a a, a um, sucrose gradient. So of course the 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 less sucrose on the top and then like the heavy like you know high percentage sucrose at, at the bottom. And basically you extract so then when you Kind of spin them in a centrifuge, they would actually like say the 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 your molecule or your organelles or, or molecule in your in your cells will migrate to the density that is equilibrate to your own density, and that's actually where the S virus comes from. It's actually it's like you know it's where actually like say they got migrated to. So that that as actually you know in case you forgot or you don't know, that's actually like say kind of tell you the the kind of like the density of of your complex. Okay. All right, I guess I tried to I have to go back to actually talk a little bit more about RNA. So if you look at actually the RNA, um, the RNA molecule on the left is actually good quality. If you move towards the right, is actually you can see general degradation. And what you see is actually is that the general decrease of the 28S and also subsequently the 18S actually got uh, degraded. So there's a couple of ways to quantify this. Number one is actually using what we call the RNA integrity number. Uh, the RIN value is really based on these features that I kind of went through. And, and basically the, the, um, the presence of the good RNA features, such as the large representative RNA, will increase your uh, RIN value. The perfect is 10, the, 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 the worst is actually zero. Um, and the poor quality RNA, such as actually, like, say, you see a lot of actually, like, say, absence of your ribosomal RNA, but or actually a lot of low molecular um, weight RNA, then you you would decrease actually your RIN value. So, so this is actually a gel. Again, you can actually see the um, you can plot out the intensity versus the molecular weight on the on the diagram like this. So you can see that the two peak, you know, of the large ribosomal RNA, and then move towards the left-hand side, the smaller molecule weight. So in a poor sample, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a big peak actually around here, which is actually in the next picture here. So this is actually like say typical actually FFP samples that have poor quality. And you can see actually the disappearance of all the large ribosomal RNA. So, and these actually, as you see, the, the, the ring variables actually pretty low. They are like four below. You can also use the term uh, DV200 um, to kind of uh, 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 kind of evaluate the quality. DV200 is literally the percentage of the fragment that is larger than 200 nucleotides. So you literally actually draw a line here in your electropherogram and then calculate the percentage of each of your trace, the area that is about, um, uh, about actually 200 nucleotides. So if you have much more um, fragments Above 200 nucleotides, you have a higher DV200. You have actually more below them that you have a low DV200. What we actually normally see is that is that for FFP samples, you usually have a low DV200. But more importantly, if you actually have something that's actually 20 or, or, or lower, just don't even bother working with that. Because you think about that, the majority of your fragment is actually lower than 200 uh, um, nucleotide. It's really going to be like you're going to be maybe reading actually 100 or 150 at most actually on your NGS or maybe even lower than that, and you may not get enough information for that. Your DNA is actually very, very degraded by then. All right. Now we're gonna go through um, a, a quick actually um, step-by-step -step actually on the Illumina uh, short read um, um, protocol. So the first one is actually a uh, whole genome. So again, whole genome DNA intact. What you wanna do first thing first is you need to um, shear them. So in the lab, and you will see those instruments, you use uh, uh, a focused ultrasound locator. Usually it's a company called Covaris that's do that. You can actually in a single chip or on a plate. You fragment them, usually it takes about five minutes um, or so per sample. Now, um, and then, and then of, as I mentioned previously, now once you have um, uh, the, the kind of shear DNA, now you want to kind of um, uh, repair the ends and fill in all the gaps, plus also add the A-telling. It will take actually around, around uh, 60 minutes or so, and then you add the adapter to your DNA. So what you have is actually is that your end repair a tail DNA fragment will have the A sticking out. And then what you can do now, you can complement with the T on your adapter, which is a double-stranded adapter. And now you actually kind of like glue those adapter to both ends of your DNA molecule. So that, that step takes, again, another 
20 minutes or so. These are all done actually either on a heat block or in a, a thermal cycle. And after that, what you want to do is you, because you're adding excess amount of adapters to actually increase the chance of your DNA being captured by the adapter. So what you want to do, you want to get rid of any excessive uh, adapter and other actually you know, reagents or enzyme in there. So normally what we do is you do a beat cleanup. And the way that you do is you add the beat mixture at a certain ratio to your, to your samples reaction. And then you use a magnetic beat rack to kind of Kind of um, you know, and your and your and your good DNA will bind to the the magnetic beads, and they will actually now be captured. You can actually get rid of the rest actually by using a magnetic beat rack actually to kind of kind of concentrate your magnet and then get rid of any actual supernate that that contain all the junk actually in there. Once you finish that, you do a extra uh, a step of uh, index PCR where you actually introduce indexes to um, both end, usually both end of your fragments. So that actually did that create a molecular barcode for your sample. Again, after that, you do a, another round of beat cleanup, and that actually now you get your pure PCR plus uh, whole genomes library. So the whole process more or less can be done in a single day at a bench by a single technician. Um, and, and usually a single technician can probably process manually about you know, 20, to, 20 to 30 samples at a time. As mentioned earlier, there is the other way of uh, whole genome library preps, especially um, in, in a case where um, you, you may want to do um, no PCR. What you can do is that you can have a different form of adapter where you not only have the adapter sequence, but also add the index already in your adapters. And you just do a cleanup at the end of the day, um, and then you got a PCR-free whole genome library. Okay. Now, again, the whole genomes library also formed the basis of the targeted sequencing library. So I'm actually going to go through quickly the next one. So when we say kind of um, uh, um, whole um, uh, targeted sequencing is really is you have a set of genes that you're interested in. You actually want to fish out from a pool of whole genomes library with either with a mix of your target sequence and your off target sequence. So it's indicated here. Um, you know, um, um, that, you, you know, the, the, the gray one is your target and then the green one is your off target. Now, what you're going to do is that you take this pool, same, so you create this pool by the same process as a piece previous slide. Now, what you do is you denature these, um, these libraries to make a single strand. And what, what you do is, um, and then first thing first is you block the um, adapter region. So then the, your, your kind of capture probe, which is in a single, um, a, a strand of DNA oligo will not bind you know, non-specific to them. So you block actually all, all of your adapter. It takes about 30 minutes or so. And then now you hybridize your capture probes onto, um, or onto your block uh, DNA fragments. So this normally you know, um, would take about two hours, um, the quickest, but sometimes people tend to incub uh, uh, hybridize it overnight to kind of get the max capture as possible. As you can see that the capture probe is a single DNA, um, single strand DNA uh, probe. It does touch have something attached there, which is a bio, usually is a biotin molecule because it is using the biotin streptavidin um, um, interaction for, for um, um, kind of purification step. So that's actually kind of get what you get actually. Once you finish your hybridization, you add um, streptavidin beads to them. And again, you now you kind of use magnet um, to kind of uh, uh, pull out those um, Magnetic beads now, which have the streptavidin uh, 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 biotin complex that basically contain your captured DNA. And then you do another round of PCR on that. And now what you kind of get is your kind of um, uh, uh, targeted um, sequencing library. All right, last one is the whole transcriptome. So um, for the whole transcriptome RNA, um, same thing actually what I mentioned earlier, you have two parses, you can either get the uh, mRNA. So what you do is all the mRNA has a poly A tail and how you can actually uh, be able to kind of pull them out from a RNA mix is using a um, oligo DT, which is actually in this box here, like a oligo DT um, uh, uh, primers or a probe that attached to a MAC beads and you can actually pull them out from, from the, a mixture of RNA um, uh, poly and non-poly RNA pools. So you can do that, and after that, you do a, uh, mRNA fragmentation. 
Versus actually on the right hand side is that if you want to kind of study the whole transcriptome, including both coding and non coding uh, RNA, what you do is uh, you kind of try to get rid of, instead of fishing out your, your, your target, you actually get rid of, you use the fishing out process to get rid of your excess uh, RNA, which is the ribosomal RNA. So what you do is you use, um, again, DNA probe against the ribosomal RNA, you bind to the ribosomal RNA, and then because you have an RNA-DNA complex, you can utilize the RNA-SH, which would degrade um, the RNA of the uh, 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 DNA-RNA uh, um, uh, hybrid, followed by actually uh, um, getting rid of the DNA probe by using a DNA treatment. So now you, what you end up is you get rid of all the housekeeping ribosomal RNA, you left with all the um, ribosomal RNA depleted RNA that is both coding and non-coding. Again, fragment them. And now you, what you can do is you can do your library. So they, the way you use library is that now you have to make them into cDNA. Usually the process is to actually use a random primer. So like say a, a string of about six uh, um, random primers um, ends. So that's random primer word to me is actually like a mixture, equal mixture of uh, ATCG in there. So you can actually kind of bind to any sequence possible. Make your cDNA and then amplify them, and then you'll get actually your your whole transcriptome library. So that's the kind of like your kind of workflow actually with that. The process usually takes between almost a full day to a day and a half of this process because they kind of like the um, purification, the enrichment process takes a little bit longer time. The one thing, as I mentioned, a lot of this was done actually usually by manually, but in a higher throughput uh, uh, facility like ourselves, um, one thing I want to draw attention to, and we can kind of go and take a look in our in our lab, is that automation becomes actually more and more important. And I think there's pen benefits to that too. So number one is actually it's increased uh, throughput. These instruments, as shown here, so the the bottom left one is a Kingfisher, which is a um, a workhorse for DNA RNA extraction, and then the right hand side is actually a Hamilton Star, which is actually a workhorse for um, a library prep, same thing actually the one in the middle for the rep, brevity um, cycle is actually for library prep. Um, these, these can actually uh, work with uh, from one to 96 samples. So, so you, you can actually have a, even a smaller batch if you want to, you, they can actually be all kind of done on this instrument. The good thing with that is it actually provides accuracy and consistency. And in fact, actually like say a um, instrument like the Hamilton Star, the tips actually have um, have some electric wire that incorporate that this minute electric wire, they actually can sense liquid in there. So if your if your um, pipetting is error, errorless in, in, in the procedure, they actually can come up with a, a signal and then alert you. And in fact, the uh, the cool thing with Hamilton is, is that you can actually um, kind of program it to slack you. So so like you know, just like any message, it will actually let's say you know you, you can walk away. And then if the instrument have an error, you can actually get a Slack message immediately, and then you can get back to the lab and actually look at that. So it's kind of pretty cool actually with that. But again, it is important because having this system allow you actually, your lab staff to kind of fully walk away. It does actually give everyone actual flexibility. Not that I, I need the staff to work more, but more actually now you can handle things with ease and with more attention. But also at the same time, pipetting definitely is a physical string and it definitely helped reduce actually a lot of the um, uh, physical string of lab staff. Any questions so far? We're almost there. I know it's lunch. All right. I kind of like, you know, I this will be the slide that really trans help transition possibly to the next couple of modules. I think that there's a lot of conceptual discussion actually so far with my talk. And actually, we never even see a basis actually on this. So, so I'm finally actually introduce you some, some DNA sequences in here. So we see all these kind of uh, 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 match stick uh, a diagram of a library, which actually have the, uh, your DNA or, or CNA fragments of interest in the middle, and then your adapter with the I5 and I7 index. So how does it actually look like in reality? So here's an example, okay? So I kind of expanded actually, of course, actually like I, I don't have a C, I don't, I didn't put the sequence of your DNA fragments or RNA fragments in there, but generally they are around 150 to 300 bases, and they are in the middle. And then on the both side is kind of your adapter, right? 
So each of them are usually around 70 base pair, and they're pretty standardized, especially if you're like on the Illumin system. This sequence is basically standardized for everything, especially the, um, the five prime N um, of each of those is very important because that's, that if you remember the video, that's basically the stretch of sequence that allow the DNA molecule to hybridize to the oligos that's present at the bottom of the, your glass um, plate that you're gonna attach your DNA to for the sequencing. So, so these actually are, are sequences are very, very like, you know, are uniform and, and, and general. And then in the middle is what you call the uh, I5, um, I5 or I7 uh, index sequence. These indexes, I just actually have a table of example here, is usually eight bases, but could be 10 or could be 12 bases. And, and depends on the, the generation. The latest generation usually is the unique dual indexes, which means that, that the um, I7 and I5 are both unique. In the old days, um, at the very first instance, you may have every, every sample share the same, say it's the same I7, and then have different I5. And then now you can increase, kind of like you, you can kind of increase your possibility. But, but what the latest, the most recent kind of a generation, they basically have both I5 and I7, doesn't match anything at all with, within the pool. So again, if you think about that, so what does it mean in molecular way, which actually would tie to actually the next uh, uh, slide, is a normal library, if you think about it, the middle part is about 150 bases to 300 bases, plus actually your, um, plus your adapters, you be looking at around 280 to 440 bases in true sizes, if you run them on, let's say, fragment analyzer or tape station. And it's pretty important knowing that, because um, if you do not remove your adapter um, properly in your process, as I mentioned earlier, the adapter themselves can bind to each other and form a, a fragment. And they are, then, then you, you can't get in some problem because you could actually use this, you can, if, they, if this remain in the system, you'll be sequencing that. But now you're sequencing something with no insert in there. You're sequencing actually adapters in that. Then you're wasting actually your sequence. But also actually the funny thing is actually is that when you think about the clonal amplification of fragments, the smaller fragments actually preferentially, preferentially get um, uh, uh, amplified more. So, so having actually adapted diamonds also can kind of limit the amount of true fragments get amplified. So, so, so really actually important to get rid of your adapted diamond. And your adapted diamond is actually pretty distinctly a bit different in terms of size than your true libraries, because they are actually super small, around 120 to 140. So kind of that, that is, um, that's what you normally see. And we'll, we'll take a look at an example of a DNA library afterward. The one thing actually kind of, we kind of talk a little bit more early is actually if you have a smaller amount of samples, um, what happens is actually is that you could get a lot of libraries, but they may all be piece out duplicates. So one of the way that I, I would introduce you here, but it would probably talk a little bit more later on in, in um, uh, Larry's and uh, Ian's talk. You can also actually add um, what we call the unit molecular identifier. So these are usually um, th uh, three to six bases of mixed bases, ends that are added to the ends of your adapters and they got like gated to your DNA fragments, okay? Now, what is important for that is actually these fragments now help to identify individual DNA fragments or what you call actually kind of like an individual ligation defense prior to any uh, piece of amplification. So really is that that particular identifier help you to recognize that individual tag, actually those individual fragments from your kind of um, starting materials without uh, worrying about any piece of at that point. So then, Later on, informatically, you can use the combination of your indexes, but more importantly with these UMIs, to kind of actually, like, especially if you read a lot, and some of them are PCR duplicates, now you can actually collapse those reads into the true kind of um, uh, identifier for your true fragment. So it's very important for detecting kind of true variant level uh, on, on this. So I want to kind of bring it up so that you can know it, and we'll actually discuss a little bit more later. So how to kind of uh, quantify and, and quality control DNA fragments? Same thing, just like any DNA and RNA. You can use this method of a combination of cupid and uh, electrogel or capillary electrophoresis. Same actually I mentioned before. Here's a trace of uh, good um, and uh, good DNA libraries at the bottom, B. So um, these two peaks on the both end are just 
a alignment peak. So this is actually really just kind of making sure that all the fragments are aligned properly so they are a fixed um, 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 uh, molecular weight. And again, left-hand side is smaller, and then right-hand side is large molecular weight here. What you will see is that usually it's a distribution, and you can see that these are uh, DNA library you should have around, you know, between, again, 280 to 400 um, average um, base, pair, base pair size. Here's the case where it is still accept on the top is an acceptable library. Same thing, you get a good distribution, but then you see a small peak around like 100, 120. That's actually your adapted diamond. But if you think about the area, it has, you know, around 10% or less, it's still a good acceptable amount library. In contrast, I think the picture doesn't show here. Let me actually see if I can show it. Oh, it's got deleted actually. So, um, in contrast, actually, let's say um, in a in a poor library, I'll kind of actually kind of let you imagine is that you would have this peak here super high, and contain actually let's say over fifty percent of the area. That will be a really like your know, bad library with a high adapted dimer uh, 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 content actually. So now. Once you get these two, so you weigh the quality and actually the quantity, you also, what, what you want to do is you want to calculate your um, library concentration in um, nanomolar. The reason why is actually this is the um, quant the unit that we use to determine how much to load on a sequencing instrument. So you can use this um, uh, 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 equation here, basically using your qubit, um, qubit actually reading, plus your library, um, um, your, your average molecular size based on um, your trace and then calculate the concentration. So that's one way you can do that. The other way you can also do is using a adapter-specific PCR, QPCR reaction. So you use primers against the common adapter, and then use the QPCR instrument to amplify it. Again, use a standard curve with a pre-made QPCR library standards, and then determine your library concentration out from there. And even actually with this method, you, should, you may be able to kind of figure out that it's actually um, at that dimer or not, because they have a different melt curve, right? So here's actually a good trace in here. And then here's actually a library with slightly um, contamination. Um, so you can see that the flag peak here, and then there's actually like a small peak here to actually identify at that dimer. All right, once you set up the sequ uh, once you actually get all your library quantified, um, you know, you may have, let's say 10, 20, or 100 libraries. Now what you're gonna do, you're gonna actually kind of put them together to load it onto a um, uh, instrument to sequence. The fact that, again, coming back to the classic kind of uh, diagram of, of, your, uh, of, the, of the libraries, because you're adding index to them, so that means that you can literally mix, like, you know, hundreds of libraries in the same group. And this is actually what we call multiplexing, okay? And um, and so um, and it really depends on that. I'll, I'll go for a couple of samples later on. So you can put actually, like, say, multiple samples in the same sequencing pool and sequence them all together. Now, how you want to do that? They, there's a few kind of guidelines and some consideration to that. So the number one for multiplexing is really is to avoid, of course, avoid having duplicate index. You don't want to use the same index for two different samples because now you won't be able to identify them. But more importantly, you also don't want to have index that are too much closely related to each other. So here's some example. So let's say this is the five indexes we want to load together. Immediately what you see is actually is that there are two. There are two samples that have the same index. Uh, that you really want to avoid. You want to avoid the duplicate. But also, actually, what you can see here is that you have um, two samples here that they only are two um, uh, mismatched apart. It it may still work, but you may get more error, especially when you consider the section sequencing error. You may get a wrongly assigned. Um, uh, 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 um, data onto a particular sample. So something I should have to keep in mind that that's also part of the reason why you can't kind of use, you know, larger number of bases in your index, but also actually do an index because now you give more possibility of differentiation between different samples. Okay, now, once, now that, now, now once you get the libraries, now you make a pool perfectly uh, valid, uh, perfectly pooled that have no uh, index um, uh, 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 co conflicts. Now, what are you gonna do? So the way you're gonna do is now you got, let's say we do an Illumina instrument. 
Now, which instrument to use and how much, like, you know, what, what kind of uh, reagents we should be using. So here's actually one of the things you actually now have to think about is how many reads I need, actually. So, so here's an example how you calculate um, the reads that you need. Um, so the way that normally do is that like a lot of the time we use our, our, our language based on coverage, the times coverage. So for example, whole genome, I want to read my, um, my germline around 30, 30 times. Um, the reason why you think about it is actually is that your, in your germline, most of the cases is germline mutation it will be either 100%, yes or no, or 50-50. So you think about you read your, your genome uh, 30 times, it's kind of like at least in the worst case scenario, you might have five to five or 10 to 10 statistically, that might make more sense. Versus actually, if you want to look at tumor where you may be really starting to look at somatic mutation, um, you want to have your 100x, that's more, like you can go higher, but like as, at this point, the higher amount of coverage means actually like say higher sequencing cost also, but kind of right now the sweet spot for, for, for tumor is around 100x. At least actually, let's say if you have a 10% somatic variant, you actually can, have 10 reads to identify them. So kind of like, kind of what you kind of think about. Um, in a lot of the time, a whole genome, you may not need a uh, uh, unique molecular identifier because you already may have sufficient amount uh, of your genome there that, that you know, there's not a lot of effect from the PCR. So, but again, you know, it depends on what we do in the future. If we want to go a deeper whole genome, you may want to consider using your mind. Um, on the other hand, for target sequencing, you can kind of go deeper, especially because your cost is actually not as much. And, um, and, and so you can actually kind of want to actually utilize actually your my actually in there. So to kind of give you an example, so for a, so how many, how much read is needed, it's actually really calculated between the, the product of the coverage and your target size divided by the kind of read length that you want to do. So for like the human genome, you need basically 30x times around 3.3 billion basis uh, for your human genome, divide the run cycles, that's actually what you got like around 330 basis. First is actually a human exome, which actually your target size is actually only about 40 million. Um, you can see that you need much fewer reads actually on that. So if you think about that, now what you want to do is that you can prepare a pool based on your need actually. So normally what you want to do is you kind of convert your coverage into reads, and then you add them all together. And what you do is actually what we call fueling a flow cell, because each flow cell of a sequencer may have its capacity. So for example, a Nova 6 um, uh, 10B flow cell normally have about eight to 10 billion reads. So what you want to do is actually, you want to kind of put samples together that requires roughly around actually eight to 10 billion, not too over, not too little, so that you can effectively use your samples. And what you normally do is actually is that you make all your library in the same nanomolar kind of a concentration. And then now you can actually just use the, um, use the volume to kind of uh, uh, mix them up well together. And that also kind of lead to actually which sequencer you use. So again, think about actually like say the size of the instrument, what it can do. So you can see that like, you know, for, for um, genome, the whole genome, you definitely want to use the X plus, but for exome, for example, you know, between the uh, uh, LixSeq and, and the XBUS, you kind of can pick, depends on actually how much samples you have to run. Okay, and, um, and then um, loading a run, um, I'm gonna show you one quick video. I know that we are slightly over time, but I'll just kind of quickly show you a video. Um, or we may come back actually later on in the afternoon to, to take a look. I'll kind of show it in the, in the later in the afternoon. But the way that you, you do that is as simple as you prepare the library pool. Now you kind of um, get all these reagents um, uh, um, and you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll come back later and show you in the afternoon. I want to kind of go through, finish up this, right, this, uh, this slide. But the thing is actually you have your library pool, you literally actually can straight up load it onto the sequencer um, for the sequencing. Um, and then, and then, okay, actually, this is like, you know, so I, I think we should go for the, the, the video, actually, sorry, just kind of put that in here. Oops.
Yeah. Awesome. I'm, and I'm going to skip some part of this uh, video also. Hi, my name is Jing Ying Lin. I'm the staff training and development specialist here in Arena. Today, I'll be working with you in the steps of setting up the fund to fund the domestic access fund. And now, ready to prepare the library and consider what we have for you. So again, the instrument can actually take actually two flows out together at the same time. So unfortunately, I don't know if I have a chance to show so I want to show it's actually pretty cool. It's kind of like the um, the instrument is cut futuristics and you got load the flow so it's kind of pretty cool actually doing that. So the cool part is actually is that like you know the, the really best feeling is you everything's ready and you just press the stop button. I always actually like say tell myself, yeah, you do all the hard work, actually let me come and actually press the stop button. Right? You know, that, that would be always the fun part. But but also actually like say in the old days, I, I think now it's actually getting better, but you know in the last generation of the Novus 6000, each low cell reagent kit was in the range of forty thousand dollars Canadian. So literally, if I want one kit, I will say, oh, shoot, actually, that's my, it's more than my, uh, the, the crappy crow that I'm driving, that actually I'm wasted on. If it's fair, actually, it's that, that big. But now it's like, the biggest flows I write now, each of them is actually around 25K. So actually each run, if you run both sides together, it's like around 50K. So not a lot. I mean, still actually, let's say, I mean, enough for me to buy another new car, actually, but that's actually how much extra this is. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I, I, I kind of like want to wrap this up here. This is actually the, the morning part. I have a couple of slides that I, I could actually do it actually in the afternoon uh, section when we do actually that discussion. It's going to be just five minutes actually going through. But I think let's wrap up for now because actually I, I'm hungry. You guys are hungry. And uh, yeah, we'll come back at...
One o'clock. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. All right, so where we left off is um, we I went through the, this morning in the molecular and literally actually from samples all the way to preparing the libraries and then sequence your samples uh, on the instrument. The last part was seeing how actually an instrument being operated and being loaded. So kind of that's where we left off. So kind of um, just to carry on, and I'm going to spend like just a few minutes on the last few slides on my um, morning presentation, and then we'll go into an exercise um, activity. Um, so this part here is really after the run, um, of course, you want to make sure that you, your run works and your runs actually have good quality. So I'm going to touch on a little bit on uh, run quality control so then you can kind of see what other things go through um, the lab uh, when we evaluate actually the, uh, the output. So, so what I have is I put actually two screenshots for, uh, from an Illumina run. So this is actually run, run, this is run on uh, one of our um, NextSeq uh, system. And, um, and this is viewed by a um, Illumina uh, our own uh, user interface. Uh, this one is very simple. This is actually a window-based uh, user interface. It's called a sequ uh, sequencing uh, analysis viewer. What it does is actually pull metrics from a run file and then, um, and then kind of um, um, computes their uh, quality and, um, and then present it in a very simple way so you can actually kind of look at that. So, on the left uh, left um, picture, uh, what you see is that first of all, this is actually the the one with the grid is literally actually um, they divide when they kind of image your flow cell, they don't image the flow cell all at once. They actually all, like kind of divide it in grid and then they sequence each grid and then you come up with actually matrix for each grid. So this is actually just a um, just showing this. This one actually what I've shown is the uh, Q thirty range. Uh, Q30, I'll go into Q30 in a moment. Um, Q30 matrix actually on each of the um, each of the grid of a flow cell. Um, so you can see any variability in there. But you know, if you look at the actual scale, actually there's a very minor minor scale there. So even though the color seems to be very, very different, but actually they are pretty um consistent over there. And then there is um there is a option of showing other kind of metrics in there. So I'll kind of bring a couple uh, more important. The simple one is actually um, data by length. So this is actually really showing you how much data I've generated by length. Um, so, um, and, and, and that really depends on the specification of the flow cell. So there's actually one numbers there that, that, that's actually showing the, uh, the amount of reads there. And it, it will actually, you will show a little bit more actually on the right hand side when actually we actually look at the numbers. And then on top of that uh, is a pretty interesting graph. And this is really, um, this is a, what we call the Q30 graph. So let me actually introduce what is Q30. Is it, it's more actually in, in a more formal way, it's called percent, percent Q30, Q over 30, which means that this is the percentage, oh, sorry, percentage of base uh, with a Q30 quality or higher respectively. So what does that mean? Q30 is literally means one in a thousand error. So kind of if you derive it, Q20 is one in a hundred error and Q, Q40 is one in 10,000 error. So here actually what normally do right now, still the um, industry standard is looking at the error rate in one in a thousand. So, so we're looking at the percent base call that is um, above um, Q30. So what you see in this graph here in the middle is that this is monitoring the quality over the, um, the time of the run. And they are basically, kind of the x-axis is the uh, cycle number, which is basically, if you think, go back and think about the sequencing by synthesis, you add, you have a template DNA, you add a base one cycle at a time. So then, so when we say um, a, uh, do a, a, a pair and read two by 150, which means that we'll go first, go out one direction, adding 150 bases, and it's one base at a, at a time. So each cycle, so you do 150 cycle, each cycle you get one base at a time. So that's actually like say the left hand side, that's actually like the zero to one. So, so in this case, this run is actually um, one, like two by 100, so it's um, zero to 100 cycles. And then in the middle of it, you will see there is actually two lines separating them. This is actually the, um, the time where you read out the index. So the index will queue specifically by the instrument to read. 
So you have two cycles here. Actually, we used uh, eight bases. So you have two eight cycles in here, in, in the middle of the graph that actually look at the quality of your index reads. And then your temper switch, and now you read back the other direction. The last 100 cycles is your, your read to 100 cycles. So what you want to see is your um, Q30, the quality maintain as high as possible. So general specification for, let's say, Illumin system, you're looking at at least 80% or higher basis are um, Q30 or, or more. Now, the what effect is, is usually is that if you have a longer risk, usually your enzyme quality can start degrading over time. So you will see that for each of the um, cycles here, um, the, the, the read one and read two, they might have some drops towards the end, so slightly curved downwards uh, towards the end. But because this is a two by 100, pretty short, rather shorter reads. Um, this is mainly for targeted panel. Um, you can see that it maintains actually pretty high. So this is actually a, a, an example of pretty good actually run quality. And then there's some cumulative numbers. So this is actually like say, you know, on, on this table, it's kind of like your cumulative number over time and, and, and the overall run is actually like, you know, Q30 is um, about 90% actually over Q30. Same thing, you also can use a heat map actually and see actually distribution of your um, Q30 over time. So kind of like kind of seeing your kind of your error rate and actually how good actually your run is. Um, there's also other other table that you can see on this uh, scanner. Um, you would actually see things like um, like all these actually represented in uh, numbers. So some of the things that you can pay attention to is things like reads a passing filter, so which is basically the number of clusters or reads passing filter. Um, that actually can't make it through and 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 is quality quality qualify for analysis. So, what you want to do is normal run. You want to actually make sure that a, a, it meets the flow cell expectation. So here's um, here's a, a P two flow cell from um, from a next seek expectation is you want to get like around four hundred million reads. And if you look under this table right around here where my cursor is, it has generated about five hundred five hundred fifty three million reads. So that means actually it kind of meet and slightly um, uh, go above the expectation. So it really depends on the type of samples and type of libraries you run. So most of the time, and also your optimization. So most of the time you really want to make sure you hit the spec because otherwise if you under kind of deliver your data, not only that you have to go back, maybe sequence more, but then at the same time, that means that it will cost you also more actually per base for sequencing. The other thing I want you to pay attention to is a column here called align percentage. Um, and this one, this one here, that have about two percent actually aligned reads. The um, the 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 reason why you put um, you 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 measure that is this is this is a, a of all the reads that you generated, it will compute also the reads that is aligned to a, a phi x uh, genome. So it's a phage genome. The reason why we put this phage genome in there is to like phi x are usually spiking in a uh, short read. Uh, uh, sequencing run to increase the uh, kind of diversity because uh, base calling again. If you kind of remember, actually, we talk about um, the index um, diversity. If you, it's the same thing actually with any kind of sequence. If you have kind of samples that are too identical, it's very very difficult when you have like your millions of a cluster in a very small space to um, get identified. So what you do is you spike in a foreign uh, genome, which is a five genome, which is a commonly known. And then you you kind of use that to increase the diversity because most likely at each cycle the base call in a five genome will be slightly different than whatever genome that you are actually going to be um, uh, sequencing. So that's actually kind of like one thing that that you also kind of check to make sure that your your five spike in, in, in is at the right amount. So give you another extreme example. For example, um, a lot of people doing metagenomics, you actually are sequencing only one single amplicon. It's usually a segment of your 16S ribosomal uh, DNA. Uh, ribosomal RNA gene, the DNA of the 16th ribosomal uh, uh, RNA. And so it's highly conserved among bacteria, but then there is actually like say one or two basis changes here and there that kind of dis, um, distinguish your bacteria ID actually. So, so in this case, actually now you're sequencing almost the same fragment, almost like, you know, all together. So what you do is you actually have to have spike in much more phyx in the in in the way to kind of increase the diversity of the library. So then your your instrument can actually read out more accurately. Okay. All right. So kind of that wraps up all of uh, the lab part, the wet lab part. Um, but I, can't, I don't want to go through a wet lab part without even thinking about it connecting actually to a clinical. So I'm going to spend the last um, couple of slides here to just kind of, kind of 
give you an idea, actually, like say, you know, um, the, the fact that like, you know, I, I think you, you all may have some idea of accreditation, but I want to link this to actually an NGS operation. And in fact, actually, it can be done. I think that there are multiple labs in the world, including ourselves, is uh, accredited. But it does, if you kind of think about the amount of information I provide to you, there is a lot of workflow actually in the system. It's not like a single kind of a, a, a rapid test or a single uh, a Q piece, a quantitative piece of test. There's actually a lot like, you know, you, you, you kind of go from extraction, library prep, quantification, sequencing, and then, you know, the other part of our modules, actually informatics, to really put it into like a highly regulated system, actually. So, so you do like, you know, so in, in any of the clinical operation, of course, you actually have your central quality management system. But you think about the way that we're doing here is you have to kind of include all these different workflows. So in, in the case actually at OICL, we have almost like 100 plus SOPs, almost 100 actual worksheets that you all have to regulate, control it, and put it in the same system. And for each of our accredited tests, you also have to do a substantial assay validation. So we cannot just simply roll up because it works. We actually really have to look at you know all the clinical um, a, a matrix to kind of make sure that it is actually repeatable and actually is applicable to the type of reporting that we are doing. So, so it is a very complex system, but it actually really now people are starting to put it into under actually real ISO uh, um, certification. In fact, actually for us, actually, we, we not only are doing it under the uh, general global ISO um, operation, we do actually, our lab also have a clear application and uh, we also use the CAP system also so so a lot of the proficiency tests samples and uh, uh, whatnot we we do actually work with cap to kind of assay our system actually periodically um the other kind of um other other institute we we kind of have our samples also kind of uh, uh, uh do for our proficiency so um but, but again there's actually the constant testing it just can ensure actually our quality actually maintain high and lastly, actually, like I said, of course, internally we 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 do quite a bit of that. And so, some if if you ever kind of uh, working towards setting up actually a kind of a sequencing facility, or actually kind of want to be part of that workflow, I think that the thing you kind of actually have to think about, is like in our case, actually, we we really are really details on that. We actually really kind of have gates of our quality control to make sure that like each like your samples have to pass through pass through each gate before they kind of move on to the next step. So from you know, in our case, actually, there's seven gates of uh, our sequencing, uh, our, our quality control from the receipt and inspection of samples, the extraction of DNA, RNA, library prep, quantification, and then um, and then the food depth sequencing, and then and then the unique part is the, the afterward the pipeline controls plus very very inter inter uh, interpretation and a final report. All those are tightly controlled. We have a spe specified uh, metrics for that, and and the reason why we want to do that because. Is really this this little kind of um, uh, example of a clinical report. This is really uh, what we really want to do. Is we really want to ensure we can generate the highest quality um, data and consistently that can benefit patients. So that's kind of kind of wrap up kind of our part of the wet lab. Is that you know is no longer just you know for basic research. We really can use some of these um, data um, to generate like useful information to impact patients. So kind of to summarize um, my section, um, you know, I, in the first module, I kind of went through a lot of the background history of NGS and um, kind of also give you a review of uh, some of the most common NGS platform. And then, um, and then um, I kind of went through at the molecular level, um, a bit of um, the consideration of taking a, bio, a biological specimen and go through each of the steps from extraction, library prep to sequencing, what you should consider especially using a Illumina short resequencing as a sample. And then uh, I, I just the last couple of slides, talk a little bit about quality control and actually uh, lab um, accreditation. So that's kind of wrap up my part um, before we move on to the exercise. Any questions?